this video session on current management trends in diabetic retinopathy. This is a lecture which has been developed for postgraduate trainees taking an examination and it goes through the very basics of diabetic retinopathy and later on goes on to discuss uh, the different pathogenesis, the treatment methodologies, the, the clinical presentation. So what's the definition of diabetic retinopathy? It's a progressive dysfunction of retinal vasculature caused by chronic hyperglycemia. That is what is important. The disease is going to be present all of the life of the patient. So it's not going to go away. You need to tell the patient you need to control your diabetes for your control of, of this uh, diabetic retinopathy. So the successful management of diabetic retinopathy is a combination of glucose control, laser treatment and vitrectomy and represents one of the most striking achievements of modern ophthalmology. So reducing the risk of severe loss by less than 50% can be done by fundus examinations looking through the back of the eye initiated prior to development of significant retinopathy and repeated periodically by following the ETDRS guidelines for the management of subsequent diabetic macular edema or vascularization. The vast majority of diabetics, individuals who lose vision, is not because of the inability to treat their disease, but rather due to delay in medical attention. So they come late, they present late, that is the major factor for that to happen. The global epidemic of diabetes, the prevalence of diabetes is estimated to rise from 2.8 to 4.4 percent by 2030, so roughly twice. And the total number of people with diabetes is projected to rise from 171 million in 2000 to 366 million in 2030. The prevalence is estimated to be 10 percent in Pakistan and with over 5.2 million people with diabetes, it is the sixth largest country with the largest population people with diabetes mellitus. So the prevalence is highest among type 1 diabetics, it's 40%, and patients with diabetic are 25% more likely to go blind than non-diabetics, and in UK, 1,000 individuals are registered blind each year due to diabetic eye disease. They cannot see anything. This leading cause of blindness in 20 to 60 year old age group in USA as well. Now let's come on to the different types of diabetes. One is insulin dependent diabetics in which you will be giving insulin and the other is non-insulin dependent diabetes. So insulin dependent diabetes duration first five years the risk is very low. On five to ten years the risk goes up to 27 percent and over 10 years it's 71 to 90 percent but the most important thing is at 20 to 30 percent years it is 95% and 30 to 40% have proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Non-insulin dependent diabetics at presentation only 5% are presenting. It's different from insulin dependent diabetics that at presentation it is 5% because the patient could have diabetes before being diagnosed with diabetes. And uh, at 11 to 13 years it is uh, 23% and over 16 years, it is 60%. So the prevalence of diabetic retinopathy after 20 years of diagnosis, as you can see, is 60% in type two, and it's 95% at type one. Duration of diabetes after puberty appears to be most important. The risk is same for two 25 year old patients, one of whom developed diabetes at age six and other at 12 years. The risk of retinopathy in children diagnosed prior to two years have negligible risk for 10 years. Now, let's come on to the DCCT trial. That was a breakthrough trial in which type 1 diabetics with tight control of blood glucose, 4 millions per, per day, do far better than conventional therapy of one measurement per day. So, tight control had 70% reduction in the rate of development of any ROPATHY, so the two-third a reduced reduction in development and 54% reduction in progression. So half of them don't progress as compared to the conventional treatment group. So the DCCT for advanced retinopathy, even the most rigorous control of blood glucose may not prevent progression. That is to be told to the patient that is a problem which you need to sort out by 
keeping diabetes at a good control level. Then you come on to UK prospective diabetes trial in type 2 diabetics, 20%, 21% reduction in the one year rate of progression of retinopathy is seen with tighter blood pressure control. Obviously, you've got microaneurysms, blood vessels leaking out from the blood vessels. And if you give a tighter control of blood pressure, obviously that hydrostatic pressure, which is causing the blood vessels to leak, is going to be less in these patients. The renal disease is 35% of the patients with symptomatic retinopathy have protein urea, elevated blood urea nitrogen, and elevated creatinine values. So here you see this very important graph of the DCCT trial. Here you can see diabetic retinopathy is the most. Then you come on to the next one is the hypertensive diabetic. Uh, di the next one is nephropathy, and the third is neuropathy, and the fourth is microalbuminuria. Now coming on to pregnancy, the risk of developing NPDR is 10% in women who began pregnancy with no retinopathy and 4% chance in patients with NPDR at the onset of pregnancy. Progression with increased hemorrhage, cotton wool spots, and macular edema with some regression occur after delivery, especially with patients with hypertension. So untreated PDR at onset in pregnancy do poorly unless treated with pan-retinal photocoagulation. Previously treated PDR usually do worse during pregnancy. So at beginning of pregnancy with poorly pregnant, begin pregnancy with poorly controlled diabetes, strict controls suddenly brought under control, retinopathies frequently have severe deterioration and do not always recover. So the risk factors for diabetes, which are the most important things which you need to remember for all diabetics is duration of diabetes, the control of diabetes, pregnancy, hypertension, nephropathy, obesity and hyperlipidemia, and smoking. So you can see pregnancy, hypertension, nephropathy, all are going to produce a volume overload. That is the cause of worsening of diabetic retinopathy. And obesity and hyperlipidemia are other factors, smoking. So the pathogenesis, aldose reductase converts sugars into their alcohols. A glucose is converted into sorbitol, and galactose is converted into galactosol. Osmotic forces then cause water to diffuse into the cell, and sorbitol and galactosol cannot easily diffuse out of the cells, resulting in electrolyte imbalance. Their intracellular concentration increases because of aldose reductase. Damage to the lens epithelium, they have high concentration of aldose reductase and responsible for cataract seen in children and experimental animals with galactosemia in animals with experimental diabetes. So aldose reductase is found in high concentration in retinal parasites and Schwann cells. And diabetic retinopathy and neuropathy may cause by aldose reductase mediated change. Obviously, you're going to produce sorbitol and galactosol, which is going to damage the cells. So aldose reductase inhibitors clinical trials have thus far failed to show a reduction in the incident of diabetic retinopathy in or neuropathy by their use, possibly because an effective aldose reductase inhibitor with few systemic effects has yet to be developed. So it's very important or interesting to know about aldose reductase. Then we come on to the most important factor which you're treating nowadays is vascular endothelial growth factor. Direct role in proliferative retinal vascular abnormalities that are found in diabetes. Animal models have demonstrated that VGF expression correlates with the development and regression of neovascularization. Concentration in aqueous and vitreous directly correlates with the severity of retinopathy. Many other growth factors and cytokines have been implicated in the development of diabetic retinopathy. Platelets and blood viscosity. Platelet abnormalities or alterations in blood viscosity in diabetes may contribute to diabetic retinopathy by causing focal capillary occlusion and focal areas of ischemia in the retina. What is the pathogenesis of diabetic retinopathy? That is the backbone of understanding diabetic microvascular occlusion, microvascular leakage. Just get that ingrained in your mind and you will be very far ahead with from other anybody else in understanding diabetic retinopathy. So here we see it uh, diagrammatically. So what are the problems which you get? Basement membrane thickening, endothelial cell damage, 
platelet stickiness, and then you get RBC stickiness. And the reason is you've got those arterioles and you've got those venules. And at the junction in near the venular side, you're getting loss of parasite producing uh, various changes, including the start of formation of microaneurysms. So here you see microvascular occlusion, where you've got platelet stickiness, RBC changes, while microvascular leakage is due to the parasite loss which causes the fluid to come out. It's just like if you have a water pipe, a water hose in your garden, and it's got various perforations, what you'll have is when the water flows in, you'll see water coming out in all directions. That's just what is happening in patients with diabetic retinopathy. Capillaropathy is loss of parasite, thickening of basement membrane, and proliferation of endothelial cells. While hematological changes, which we've discussed before, is deformations of RBCs, activation, and reduced deformations of WBCs, Increase platelet stickiness and aggregation increase plasma viscosity. So effect of microvascular occlusion is arteriovenous shunts run from arterioles to venules and are called erma, associated with capillary dropout, while neovascularization is produced by angiogenic factors in the retina, which result in new vessel formation either on the optic disc or elsewhere on the retina, which is called NVE, or on the surface of the iris, which is called rubiosis iridis. So here you can see consequences of uh, is retinal ischemia, formation of AV malformations, rubiosis iridis, and proliferative diabetic retinopathy, all produced by this hypoxic retina. And usually that hypoxia, patients uh, being uh, diagnosed with early proliferative diabetic retinopathy have been seen in, in patients with white field angiography in which you've seen that equatorial retina starts to develop um, ischemia before you get at the posterior retina. So that's one uh, very advanced role for uh, white field imaging. So consequences of leakage is accumulation of lipids in the intraretinal spaces from microaneurysms. And obviously once that comes out the liquids, it's very difficult to bring them back. So I always tell the patient, whatever vision you've lost, it's Mostly what we are going to do is to maintain that vision, to improve that vision. Lasers probably have very little role in improving that, but the, since the advent of anti-VGF or the use of anti-VGF, increasing visual equity in patients with diabetic maculopathy has become possible. The location of lesion and background retinopathy. Here you can see it is present in the outer plexiform layer or Henley's layer and uh, the outer nuclear layer. So that's where the junction of the inner and the outer retinal circulation is. And so it's present deep in the retina. So if you see a microaneurysm, it's going to be present in the deep retina while a flame-shaped hemorrhage is going to be present at the level of the retinal nerve fiber. Here you see different pathologies, which you see obliterated uh, arterial lumen, you see microaneurysm, you see microaneurysm fluorescein angiography, you see ghosting of blood vessels. So there's a different changes. Let's go through, there are two classifications of diabetic retinopathy. One is the early house classification and the second is the ETDRS classification. The question is which one to use, you can use both, but they both are useful in different uh, categories. But I found it easy that uh, if you mix and match both, it can be useful as well. But obviously, more people are using EDTR classification. So just for the record, we go back and look at background diabetic retinopathy. You've got microaneurysms, hemorrhages, macular edema, and hard exudates. So microaneurysms are secular outpouching of the retinal wall formed by either focal dilation of the capillary wall where pericytes are absent or fusion or two arm of the capillary loop. Hemorrhages are either in the superficial layer or in the deeper layer. Retinal nerve fiber hemorrhage arises from larger superficial precapillary arterioles and because of the architecture of the retinal fiber are flame shaped as we discussed before. While intraretinal hemorrhages are around from venous end of the capillaries and are located in the deep and compact layer of the retina over here, which you see over here in outer plexiform layer. Then you could have diffuse edema and localized edema. Diffuse edema is extensive capillary leakage, while localized edema is focal leakage from microaneurysm and dilated capillary fragment. 
the retina actually becomes thicker in size and you also classify it as clinical significant macular edema which we're going to discuss later the fluid is located initially between the outer plexiform layer and the inner nuclear la plexiform layer later it involves the inner plexiform and the nerve fiber layer eventually entire retinal thickness become edematous cystoid macular edema is further accumulation of fluid in the fovea assumes a cystoid pattern Hard exudates are caused by chronic localized retinal edema developed at the junction of the normal and edematous retina. So if you've got an elevation of the retina, it's not at the top where you see the, at, not at the dome. If this is the retinal elevation, here's the dome. Here you will have um, the microaneurysm while the hard exudate will be on the side. So that's important whenever you see a diabetic retinopathy patients. Composed of lipoproteins and lipid-filled macrophages located mainly within the outer plexiform layer. The waxy yellow lesions with relatively distinct margins, which is different or to be distinguished from cotton wool spores, which have got indistinguished margin and are whitish in color, arrange in clumps and or rings at the posterior pole, typically surround a leaking microaneurysm, as I mentioned before. So here you see this is... Uh, a patient with hard exudate ring this is called a circinate pattern or a circular pattern and here you can see the microaneurysm at the center of this area and this area is going to be thickened when you see it these are similar hard exudate this is a chronic hard exudate and obviously this patient has got a very poor visual prognosis because this hard exudate is probably impossible to go away and this is a hard exudate which is of less intensity and this has got a better prognosis and this is more of a scattered hard exudate formation which is uh, obviously going to have better prognosis so if this is slight circinate pattern these are focal patterns so you will probably need to do focal laser over this side and, and this side as well so what's the di differential diagnosis of background diabetic retinopathy macular drusen hypertensive retinopathy and old branch retinal vein occlusion then we come on to diabetic maculopathy either it can be diffuse focal or ischemic then what do you call as clinically significant macular edema either it has to be present within 500 micrometer of thickening in the center of the macula or five or there's hard exudate with macular with thickening of the retina within 500 micrometers of the fovea or an area within of area of hard exudate and thickening which is present within 1500 microns of the fovea so focal is well circumscribed retinal thickening associated with complete or incomplete rings of hard exudate fluorescein angiogram shows late focal hyperfluorescence due to leakage and good macular perfusion while diffuse maculopathy is well circumscribed retinal thickening associated with complete or incomplete rings of hard exudate fluorescein angiograph shows late fluorescent hyperfluorescence due to leakage and good macular perfusion here you can see this area is diffusely uh, illuminating while this area is only focally uh, illuminating over here on fluorescein angiogram and this is OCT showing this area of diffuse thickening. Ischemic retinopathy is very important to recognize the patient might have very good poor vision but the macula might look normal. The, look there's no hard exudate seen in this patient but there's enlargement of the foveal avascular zone seen in this patient there's also capillary non-perfusion in the peripheral area of the macula as well so ischemic signs are variable and the macula may look relatively normal despite reduced visual acuity pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy may be present and fluorescein angiogram shows capillary non-perfusion at the fovea and frequently other areas of capillary non-perfusion at the posterior pole as we've shown over here you can see this is an area of capillary non-perfusion so what is the treatment of diabetic maculopathy that is a very vast question and we'll go through uh, in, in various segments you can do focal laser grid laser which can be a modified grid which where you do not involve the uh, papillomacular bundle then Anti-VGF is the backbone of treatment for diabetic retinopathy nowadays. You can start off with bevisuzumab, ranibuzumab, uh, aflibercept, and now Bovu or brolisuzumab is the next medication. Triamcinolone acetonide injections are used. You can use subtenon, intravitreal, or now supracoroidal, which is very effective. Pars plana vitrectomy in patients with traction and uh, artavostatin in patients for dyslipidemias so this is a patient with diabetic retinopathy 
and you can see different dot blot hemorrhages present in this area of um, slight RPE hypertrophy in the posterior pole. Then we come on to pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. PDR that exhibits signs of imminent proliferative disease is called pre-proliferative disease and it indicates progressive retinal ischemia, which is seen as the focal cotton wool spots. Fluorescein shows extensive hypofluorescence area represented retinary non-perfusion. You see these shunt vessels, which is called erma. You could see venous beading, venous looping, arterial abnormalities, which are present in the superficial layer of the retina. That is important. Background diabetic retinopathy is more present in the deeper retina, while pre-proliferative is more present in the superficial retina. So cotton wool spots are the hallmark of retinal nerve fiber layer ischemia. Irma, then we've got venous changes, which include dilatation and tortuosity, looping, beading, and sausage-like segmentation. Then you've got arterial changes like peripheral narrowing, silver wiring and obliteration, and dark blot hemorrhages. Sometime when the diabetic retinopathy is very active, patients will develop extensive hemorrhages. So extensive hemorrhages are an indicator that the disease is active. So let's come on to cotton wool spots, the accumulation of neuronal debris within the nerve fiber layer and the result from disruption. So you cut the neurons because of ischemia, swollen ends of which are known as cystoid bodies with healing debris removed by autolysis and phagocytosis. So if you see cotton wool spot today, you might not see them at the same place in three months time because it's, the cotton wool spots disappears. Small, fluffy, small, whitish, fluffy superficial lesions obscure underlying blood vessels and clinically evident only in the post equatorial retina with a nerve fiber layer of, is of sufficient thickness. Fica, focal hypofluorescence due to blockage on fluorescein angiography. Irma are arteriovenous shunts that run from retinal arterioles to venules, thus bypassing the capillary bed, often seen adjacent to area of capillary non perfusion. Signs, fine irregular red lines that run from arterioles to venules. Fluorescein angiogram shows focal hyperfluorescence associated with adjacent areas of closure. But the main important thing is do not leak on fluorescein angiography while new vessels or NVD or NVE will leak. Intraretinal location, failure to cross major blood vessels and absence of leakage on fluorescein angiogram. Here you see patient with uh, obviously there's sausage shape appearance of the vein, segmentation of the veins. So there's, and then you can see some looping of the veins in this area. There are dot blot hemorrhages, various present. Then see this is area of flame shape hemorrhages, cotton wool spots are present, hard X dates are present over, over in this area. And if you look carefully, you might see these erma in this area. So these are arteriovenous malformations which you see this is a typical looping which you see this is silver wiring of blood vessels or ghost blood vessels this is segmentation or sausage shape appearance of the venules and then you've got dot blot hemorrhages which you see in this patient so proliferation of pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy should be watched closely because the risk of proliferative diabetic retinopathy Sometime even you might go for treatment if the patient has come from far away and he's difficult to follow up and especially if the patient has got proliferative diabetic retinopathy on the other eye, so you might consider early treatment for that treatment. Laser treatment is usually not appropriate unless regular follow-up is not possible and vision in the fellow eye has been already lost due to proliferative disease. Every effort should be made to encourage maximum diabetic control and reduction of other systemic factors most important points which need to be remembered by the patients which they typically forget. Proliferative, pre-proliferative diabetic converting to PDR in four months. Here you can see the segment, the sausage shape appearance of the veins and there's uh, hemorrhages over here, dot blot hemorrhages, but you've got proliferative changes of neovascularization at the disc and there's obviously neovascularization over here where there's going to be formation of this pre-retinal hemorrhage. Now we come on to proliferative diabetic retinopathy. It affects 5 to 10% of the diabetic population. Type 1 diabetes are at particular risk with an incidence about 60% after 30 years. Protective factors include ipsilateral carotid artery occlusion, posterior vitreous separation, high myopia, and optic atrophy. 
PDR progression, primary feature is neovascularization caused by angiogenic factor growth elaborated by hypoxic retina tissue in an attempt to revascularize hypoxic retina. Neovascularization is promoted on the retina and optic nerve head and occasionally on the iris. Many angiogenic factors have been identified including VEGF, most important, placental growth factor and pigment epithelium derived factor. Endogenous inhibitors of angiogenesis have been reported such as endostatin, platelet growth fa factor 4, angiostatin. Net balance between VEGF and endostatin is associated with the activity of retinopathy. Over one-fourth of the retina has to be non-perfuse before PDR starts to develop. PDR can be of two types or three types actually. NVD is new vessels at the disc on or within one disc diameter of the retina. So it can be within one disc diameter. New vascularization elsewhere is along the course of the major vessels. Fluorescein angiography highlights new vascularization due to early phases of the angiogram and shows hyperfluorescence during the later phase due to intense leakage of the dye from the neovascular tissue. So actually when the new vascular is, the fluorescein is leaking, you will see that lighting up and that fluorescein actually flows into the vitreous cavity. That's why if you take very late pictures, the view of the retina becomes hazy as well because of the fluorescein. Here you can see this is the new vascularization front lighting up. There's an area of capillary non-perfusion which is present over here. And you can see this is intense area of capillary non-perfusion, frosted branch, angiitis stomach pattern. And this is the new vascularization which is present at the disc. So this patient has got extensive NVD. Although he has got pan-retinal photocoagulation, but still his NVD is active, so he needs further filling in of his laser treatment. This is mild NVD at disc, and this is severe NVD at the disc. This is mild NVE formation over here and along the supratemporal vessel, and then this is severe NVE. The important thing to remember, the NVE, if you, whenever you're looking, they're going to develop on these supratemporal, infratemporal vessels, and then Temporal to the fovea, this area is very prone to develop NVE. And as we said earlier, equatorial retina, if you do a white fleet angiography, you will see that in that pattern. And this is the area along the superior inferior blood vessels. You see a, will see a formation of a ring of fibrous tissue, which will produce later on table tabletop traction on the retina. This is mild fibrosis on the surface of the retina, and this is severe fibrosis. And as you can, as I can tell you that you can see this on the supratemporal vessel and it is forming in the form of an arch. So PDR assessment, severity of PDR is determined by area covered with new vessel in comparison with the area of the disc as fellows. NVD, mild when less than one third disc diameter area and extent severe when more than this. NVE, mild is less than one third and severe if more than this. Elevated new vessels are less responsive to laser therapy than flat vessels. Fibrosis associated with neovascularization is important. Significant fibrous proliferation carries an increased risk of tractional retinal detachment. So, some people might ask, why can't you do just direct laser photocoagulation and the neovascularization will go away? Well, it doesn't work that way. You have to reduce that VGF. So, you have to do peripheral retinal laser and then these vessels go away. So in clinical assessment, high-risk characteristics signify a high risk of severe visual loss within two years if treated. Mild NVD with hemorrhage carries 26% of visual loss, which is reduced to 4% with treatment. Severe NVD without hemorrhage carries a 20% risk of visual loss, which is reduced to 9% with treatment. Severe hem NVD with, no, with hemorrhage carries a 37% risk of visual loss, which is reduced to 20% with treatment. And severe NVE with hemorrhage cursor carries a 30% risk of visual loss, which is reduced to 7% with treatment. So you see that hemorrhage, when it happens in the vitreous cavity, the disease has progressed to a next level. And now is the time that either you will be able to catch that disease if you ca catch the patient early, or it might be too late and he will need treatment by pars plana vitrectomy. So what is the treatment for PDR? Argon laser therapy with pan-retinal photocoagulation, green laser aimed at inducing involution of new vessels and preventing visual loss. One to 2,000 burns in the scatter pattern extending from posterior fundus to cover the peripheral retina in one or more session. 
Follow-up is at after four to six weeks. In eyes with severe NBD, several treatments involving 5,000 or more burns may be required. But the main question is, initially you would aim for two to 3,000 burns if you're going on for 200 micron burns, because what you want is, you do not want to obliterate the patient's visual feed completely. So you want to give him enough treatment that his neovascularization stops, but he's got some feel and his vision loss is not very extensive at nighttime. So this is appropriate laser burns and this is PRP burns several, several days later. You can see this pigmentation, that laser is actually absorbed by the retinal pigment epithelial cell and by that photocoagulation, then the rods and cones lose their function and here, what you see after this, the retinal atrophies, most of it retinal atrophies, and you can see the sclera at the back here. You can see this area, the yellowish thing is the sclera which you're looking through without the retina. So the, what are the signs of involution? Regression of venous vascularization, leaving ghost vessel or fibrous tissue. Decrease in venous change, absorption of retinal hemorrhages and disc pallor. In most eyes, once the peritonopathy is quiescent stage, Vision is maintained and a few eyes recurrence of PDR occurs despite an initial satisfactory response. Necessary to re-examine the patient at an interval about 6 to 12 months. Sometime in patients with proliferative diabetic retinopathy with the formation of traction. If you do too much argon laser PRP, you're going to produce aggravation of that traction. So that's why we said if you've got flat blood vessels, that is the best time to treat the patients with proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Here you can see extensive formation of neovascularization at the disc. There's dot extensive blood hemorrhages, NVE formation, periphery. There's after laser, there's pallor of disc. There's regression of these neovascularization. So it usually take three months for this action of laser to take place. So treatment of recurrences may involve further laser photocoagulation, fill in, in the gaps between previous laser scars or utilizing indirect laser to treat very peripheral retina and carry cryotherapy to the peripheral retina useful when further photocoagulation is, is impossible as a result or inadequate visualization of the fundus caused by opaque retina. That is sometimes necessary and you need to remember that. Well, if you look at that, there's one treatment missing in this. That is anti-VGF. Now, even treatment studies have started in which they are just, if there's initial in a, in a neovascularization, just give an uh, anti-VGF. The problem with anti-VGF when there's formation of fibrous tissue formation, then it can produce traction. So, in early patients with uh, PDR, anti-VGF is useful to regress the disease. You do laser and that brings very good results, especially if you, and then patients who've got Retrectomy, post retrectomy, and they get re bleeds. Anti VGF is very useful for them, but do do laser to prevent their recurrences. Advanced diabetic eye disease is serious vision, vision threatening complication of diabetic retinopathy occurring in patients who have not had laser therapy and in whom laser photofagulation has been unsuccessful or inadequate. That is very important to tell the patient, especially if you've got a patient with advanced diabetic eye disease, make him talk to patients with early diabetic proliferative diabetic retinopathy because that is the only patient they're going to listen to. So what does advanced diabetic eye disease involve? That is hemorrhage, vitreous hemorrhage, tractional retinal detachment, tractional retinoschisis with or without retinal detachment may also occur and rubiosis iridis. So vitreous hemorrhage, pre-retinal hemorrhage, intra-retinal hemorrhage, intra -retinal or both, pre-retinal hemorrhage has a Precentric shape which demarcates the level of the posterior vitreous detachment. Intragel hemorrhage usually takes longer to clear than pre-retinal hemorrhage because the former are usually the result of more extensive bleed. In some eyes, altered burb becomes compacted on the posterior vitreous phase to form an ochre membrane. They need vitrectomy. Patients should be warned that bleeding may be precipitated by severe physical exertion or straining, hypoglycemia, and direct ocular trauma. And I will add, uh, uncontrolled hypertension to that as well. Ultrasonography is useful in eyes with dense vitreous hemorrhage to detect the possibility of associated retinal detachment. So the rule is, if you see a patient with diabetic vitreous hemorrhage, always do a B scan and then confirm that the retina is not detached, meaning that you do not have a combined tractional pregmatogenous detachment because you might sit on a vitreous hemorrhage and the patient might have a combined detachment. 
So this is a patient with a pre-retinal hemorrhage, boat shaped hemorrhage, present subhyoid space between the uh, posterior hyoid face of the vitreous and between internal limiting membrane. Here you see a tractional retinal detachment present. You don't want to see this. Uh, if you have this, then obviously the patient has a very poor prognosis. And this is a patient with tabletop retinal detachment with intragen hemorrhage. So tractional retinal detachment is caused by progression of that contracture of the fibrovascular membrane over areas of vitreous retinal detachment. Initially, you've got that vibe fibrovascular proliferation and then you've got contraction of that fibrous tissue. Posterior vitreous detachment in eyes with PDR is often incomplete due to strong adhesion between cortical vitreous and areas of fibrovascular proliferation. Traction retinal detachment can also have retinoschisis with or without retinal detachment may occur. Differentiation between retinoschisis and traction retinal detachment is clinically difficult but very important. Recovery of central vision of macular redetachment is better in eyes with tractional retinal detachment than in retinoschisis. It's better to leave these patients with retinal schisis alone rather than to do very close vitrectomy on them. OCT may be useful and differentiated between these conditions preoperatively. And rubiosis iridis may occur in patients with PDR and if severe may lead to neovascular glaucoma. Rubiosis is particularly common with severe retinal ischemia and persistent retinal detachment following unsuccessful power splenar vitrectomy. So what is the management of ADD? Power splenar vitrectomy is the main method of treating severe disease indication. Severe persistent hemorrhage is the most common indication. Progressive tractional retinal detachment or involving the macula, combined tractional and regmatogenous retinal detachment and pre-macular subhyoid hemorrhage. The question is, do you want to combine anti-VGF with the vitrectomy? Yes, you can. You need to give three days or one week uh, interval, but you need to see that if the patient does not have treatment, the traction is going to become significantly more. So you need to have all set up for that to happen. Obviously, what it does is reduces the peroperative bleeding because of the regression of blood vessels. It is most common indication, persistent severe hemorrhage. When can you do a diabetic retinopathy? You can do it for an early vitreous hemorrhage if the patient is only eyed, but you can delay it for a while and patient has got two eyes and one eye is pretty good. Then see the hemorrhage precludes adequate PRP, that is the main indication. Vitrectomy is traditionally considered within three months of initial vitreous hemorrhage in type 1 diabetes and about six months in type 2. Probably this is not the case nowadays. You can do it in within one month depending on uh, what is the, the amount of the patient and how severe the disease is because you've got now 23 gauge vitrectomy and 25 gauge vitrectomy which has improved the outcome of vitrectomy significantly. Vitrectomy is frequently offered earlier regardless of diabetic disease and in any case with bilateral involvement. Progressive tractional RD threatening or involving the macula must be treated without delay. However, extramacular traction detachments may be observed. They often remain stationary for a prolonged period of time. Combined traction and regmatogenous detachments should be treated urgently even if the macula is not involved because subretinal fluid is likely to spread quickly to involve the macula. So you need to be pretty quick on those. Pre-macular subhyoid hemorrhage, if dense and persistent, should be considered for early vitrectomy because untreated, the internal limiting membrane or posterior hyoid face may severe as scaffold, serve as scaffold for subsequent fibrovascular proliferation and consequent tractional retinal detachment or macular epiretinal membrane formation. So general screening, normal fundus is annual screening, mild BDR with small hemorrhage or hard exudate greater than one disc diameter from the fovea, do annual review, routine re referral, BDR with large hard exudate within the major temporal areas but not threatening the fovea, and BDR with ma without maculopathy but with reduced visual acuity. Early referral, BDR with hard exudate or hemorrhages within one disc diameter from the fovea or pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Urgent referral, PDR, if you're looking through a direct ophthalmoscope, see new vessels need to be urgently referred. Pre-retinal or vitreous hemorrhage, rubiosis, iridis, and retinal detachment is obviously an emergency. So this is a case at the end. Here you can see we're going to describe or discuss what we see over here. This is the patient with hard exudate over here. In the posterior pole, dot blot hemorrhages at the posterior pole. This is a, a red tree photograph showing these black, the vessels are black in color, the hard exudates are different colored. And here you see the microaneurysm light up at these white spots, and this is an area of capillary non perfusion, especially in this area. Then you've got these, these um, 
areas of micro aneurysm which you see in this spots and these are areas which they light up at a later stage so this is the area of non capillary non perfusion and this is lighting up fairly fairly bit and this might be an area of early neovascularization nve but this is an area of very papillary atrophy so there doesn't seem to be any area of neovascularization in this patient so this is another patient you can see these flame shaped hemorrhages in the retina and both the posterior poles the scup disc ratio is 0.4 on both sides the, the hemorrhages are obviously evident on this area as well but this area these whitish spots are cotton wool spots and these are not hard exudates so they can be seen more brightly white as as this so cotton wool spots usually present in along the blood vessels and and they're associated with hemorrhages as well so look at a fluorescein angiogram of that same patient with hemorrhages are showing as areas of masking but there seems to be microaneurysm which are leaking at a later stage but there does not seem to be any active proliferation or proliferative disease so that is going to be patient with background diabetic retinopathy with uh, macular edema now looking at this patient you've got formation of cotton wool spots over in this area as well because these are uh, these are perpendicular to the blood, retinal nerve fiber which are running in this pattern and you've got this blood hemorrhage but you can see because he's got cotton wool spots this extensive ischemia this capillary non perfusion over here over here over here so this is an area which has got macular non perfusion so you need to see at a later late stage of the disease and there doesn't seem to be any significant there's staining from this area where there's ischemia and the fluvial avascular zone is enlarged as well well this is a patient with advanced diabetic eye disease with traction of the retina this patient actually had a vitrectomy and this is siliconized eye as well but there's definitely traction which is producing which you cannot do very significant visual rehabilitation in these patients and this is a patient with uh, pre some hyaline hemorrhage which is present and this is typically you need to ask the patient to look inferiorly and you will find these areas of hemorrhages so i think i'll wind up uh, from the first lecture on diabetic retinopathy we'll come back on a second lecture and go through the different treatments in detail and do the etdrs classification as well thank you very much for watching and uh, i hope you like this video